Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response. Welcome back. This is session 76 of our uh, long running, three year running uh, series on uh, how libraries have been responsive to, of course, the COVID crisis and a series of crises after that, which just continues to amaze and astound us. Uh, we have two extraordinary speakers with us today, Deb Fallows, Deborah Fallows, author of Our Towns, A 100,000 Mile Journey to the Heart of America and Dreaming in Chinese, which I'm not aware of and I want to be aware of Dreaming in Chinese. I think it's really important that we, that we can connect with Chinese these days. And of course, Crosby Kemper is returning uh, uh, for, I don't know, maybe the third time, Crosby. Uh, the director of IMLS and our fearless leader in Washington. <laughs> um, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open consortium of, of tech innovating libraries. Uh, our partner is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, based in the Netherlands. The, uh, uh, the organization through which we can connect to libraries around the world through the national libraries and the national library associations. Today, we have sponsorship support from Funds for Learning, which is always appreciated. And with us uh, is Kathy Cruzan, the president of Funds for Learning, and also a board member of the Schools, Health, and Libraries Broadband Coalition. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Just tell us what Funds for Learning is, if you would, real quick. Thanks, Don. A uh, quick hello to everybody. Thank you uh, for allowing us to host this session. I'm looking forward to learning more. In Funds for Learning, we help libraries, library systems, schools, and school districts that apply for E-rate. And that's, that's what our sole focus is. We also provide data to stakeholders in the program. So my one ask to you, if you are a library or an applicant that participates in the E-rate program, we have our survey open. It's a 13 year, it's the 13th year we've done that. We gather that information from um, libraries and schools that participate in the program and we provide that feedback to the FCC. And so it's some of it's just future questions. If you don't participate in the program, I'd still encourage you to, to take the survey and provide your feedback and be valuable. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the session. Thanks, Don. Very cool, Kathy. Thank you. They do great work over there. Thank you for uh, sponsoring for us today. Uh, these are just a list of some of the projects, to kind of who we are. A lot of people have never heard of Gigabit Libraries Network. We do projects and we also get involved in policy. We, we think they go together. Uh, projects help you understand the implications of policy uh, positions that you may take. Uh, these are all listed on our website, giglibraries.net. Uh, we really started in response to the pandemic in March. I think it was like a week the week that the pandemic was declared and everybody was going, well, what is this all about? And so we posed the question, well, what is a library if the building is closed? Is it nothing? Well, no, it's not nothing, but what? And how does it operate? We were all trying to figure out. It was a big reaction moment. It's, it's hard to remember how intense that was and how dramatically the entire world civilization changed overnight. It's never happened like that before. Nothing has ever caused such a dramatic sudden change. We're mostly better except for this, this kind of horror that is haunting the, the world with tens of millions of people having these lingering after effects. And the, they just haven't gotten after uh, trying to find out what this is all about hard enough. Uh, I'm wishing our health uh, researchers good and swift luck in doing that. The other crisis that, of course, is always with us is, is, the, is the climate crisis, and it's irreversible. It's inevitable. We're in this. And so a point that we have tried to make, besides the one that's stated here, is that we're going to be trying to figure this out for a long time, is, uh, uh, this is our happy slide here, is that there are two kind of uh, approaches, responses. One is mitigation, of course. This is going to be action by everybody is also mainly going to be action by the major players, the, the largest countries, all the financial infrastructure are all going to have to change somehow to actually accomplish uh, real mitigation. On the 
companion side is adaptation. And this scales down to the individual level and certainly to the community level. And this is a, an area we think libraries have a special opportunity is to help their communities with adaptation strategies and resources. Uh, and then another crisis, which has come kind of recently, is what, what is this, this thing that has uh, erupted suddenly into everybody's uh, awareness? Uh, what does it mean? How is it? What is it, in fact? We've, del we've delved into, uh, well, we've delved into all these crises, and this is our one that we have taken up a thread on. We expect to, uh, well, actually, we're going to have a return session in two weeks from today, so mark your calendars. So uh, one thing to say about libraries that we love libraries, we just think they're the absolute best. And uh, we think it's kind of the tent pole of civilization, if you will, that they'll be the last institution standing or the first one coming back. But uh, they do more things for more people than any other institution. And that makes them very special, but also creates a special challenge because in people's minds, libraries are about books, a place where you can get books. Well, yes, of course, that's true, but they do so, so much more than that. It's hard for them to be known. I mean, everybody knows what clinics are and schools are and you know, all these other institutions have very narrow charters. Libraries across all these domains act as backups to the other institutions and do additional things on top of that, like help people, you know, work with uh, e-government or, or anything that people ask them to do. So they're incredibly special. Uh, so let's get to the program. Uh, and, and here we are with uh, uh, Deb and Crosby. Crosby is going to take us out here to, with the state of the libraries in, in, in America, we say, and then we'll have hear from Deb on her experiences and her insights. So with that, I will stop the share. And welcome, Crosby, back. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Okay, great. It's great to be here, um, and great to be here with you. And uh, I use the the idea of the library being the Swiss Army knife uh, of the community all the time. I'm pretty sure I stole it from you, but I, uh, in any case, I, I well, use it. And 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 I want to use some uh, a couple of things that. Uh, that, that Deb Fallows and and, uh, and Jim Fallows said in their in their book Our Towns, which I think is a wonderful book, um, and uh, there, there's a, a phrase at the beginning which unfortunately I can't quote exactly because I left my Kindle on the train from Washington to uh, Jersey City, um, and but Deb, I think it's Deb talking in the book about this. Uh, li libraries, of course, uh, became a, a, a feature in your book, Our Towns, and, and uh, uh, heart, the heart of the community in, in a lot of ways. And you talk about the word problems um, and libraries as a place where problems are being brought. And that goes to the Swiss, Swiss army knife idea. I, I, I went to the, the last big public meeting before the pandemic was the Public Library Association, where they gave an award to Rivka Sass, the director of, uh, she got the Community Librarian Award, the director of the library in Sacramento, and the deputy mayor of Sacramento said, when we have a problem in Sacramento, we refer it to the, uh, the Sacramento Public Library in Rivka Sass. And then in the middle of the pandemic, I went to Memphis to give a national medal to the Memphis Public Library. The deputy mayor showed up and said, when we have a problem in Memphis, we refer it to the Memphis Public Library and uh, Kenan McCloy. And, and but the, the 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 best one of all because it reflects actually solving problem of the pandemic, uh, in the information problems we have in this country, the polarization, et cetera. So I went to present a national medal to a tiny little library, Highwood Public Library in Highwood, Illinois, town of five thousand, north north shore of uh, of Chicago land, uh, amidst a lot of uh, very wealthy communities. It's actually a fairly poor community. The 5,000 uh, citizens of, uh, of uh, Highwood are mostly uh, significantly Hispanic, significant uh, English as a second language, uh, pover high poverty level. And the, the folks who the pandemic hurt the most in, in terms of learning and in terms of the actual effect of the pandemic infection and death. And uh, Carmen Patlin, the librarian, who uh, by the way has only a high school education, um, Carmen Patlin uh, was so engaged with the community 
that she created a program of vaccination, vaccination education and vaccination uh, in that community with Walgreens as a partner and, and pretty much every other community organization in, in Highwood and community actor, the, the mayor, the congressman. Uh, and she vaccinated 5,000 of the 5,000 community members uh, of uh, the city of Highwood, uh, Illinois. Pretty extraordinary. And I guarantee you they had a better experience in the pandemic than the average American community or even the average wealthy American community or the average communities in the North Shore of, of Chicago. And so it, it's an example of what libraries can do. We are as, as uh, uh, we're part of what a phrase that I did write down uh, from, uh, from our towns, uh, the the, the uh, restoration and revival uh, of the civic uh, in in our small towns, medium sized towns, the towns that Jim and Deb visited uh, for for the for our towns, and and they 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 talk about two two folks that I talk about in my in my speeches, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, and his democracy in America and, and his view of America as a, a this is really before the, the public library became something uh, in America, uh, associating at the local level to solve problems. Uh, that we, we create associations in America. We're, we're, we're all ultimately Rotarians, right? And, and then there's Frank Capra and his view of, of, of the sort of humanity, the bed, how Bedford Falls works. If you, you will, or what happens when Mr. Uh, uh, Smith goes to Washington, uh, and and that we, we all inhabit a little bit of a Frank Capra universe. Of course, there are also those moments in Frank Capra when the mobs arrive. You know, you remember that in, in Bedford Falls when they want their money out of the savings and loan, um, uh, or uh, in, in Meet John Doe, where it's which is Capra's dark movie. We're and we're a little bit of a dark time uh, in the library world and in our national world. You know, book book banning going on, the polarization of, of, uh, of our time is, uh, is very high and is affecting libraries, the book ban thing, state of Missouri, my home state, the legislature, one, one house of the legislature voted to defund libraries. Now the state's not providing a whole lot of money to begin with. And the Secretary of State, who's a friend of mine, Jay Ashcroft, uh, put out some rules that would basically allow any uh, 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 parent or library patron to come in and restrict any book claiming that it was prurient, uh, no definition of prurience uh, 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 made there. So we, ha we have that problem. And then we have, we have the basic information problem and literacy problem. So number one, a basic literacy problem, which affects particularly people on the other side of all of our divides. And libraries have always been about that. And we need, we need to reinvigorate libraries' engagement with basic literacy. We're the biggest part of the informal support uh, for the formal uh, learning uh, and, and formal creation of, of literacy in, in, in schools and, and at home. We're the biggest support for that. We need to, uh, to, to recreate that. And we've tried to, at the IMLS to sponsor that through convenings and uh, creation of practice groups and that sort of thing. We also need to be involved in the United States Congress and its wisdom is given the IMLS uh, an information literacy task force, which I'm, I'm taking an, an hour off to be with you. We have in Jersey City, we have a convening of that going on right now at the uh, Liberty Science Center. Um, and, and, and here, you know, we have an example of the need for, for what we're talking about in the recent uh, NAEP scores, the National Assessment of uh, 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 Progress educational progress of educational progress where our civic scores for the first time in 25 years, 25 years they've been doing the civics test went down uh, and went down substantially. It's another example probably of pandemic uh, learning failure, but also a failure in our basic uh, history teaching, uh, civics teaching uh, in this country at the, at the moment we need it the most. We're part of the America 250 uh, Commission to celebrate the commemorate, invigilate, investigate the, the 250th anniversary uh, of the nation. And uh, we need to use that as a time where libraries and museums and cultural organizations generally, part of that civic uh, revival that, uh, that Deb and, and Jim Fallows have talked about, we need that to happen uh, in this country because our, our, our basic literacy uh, around our, our, our civic 
institutions and, and, and what the First Amendment is all about, what the Fourth Amendment is all about, um, is lacking. Um, and, and, that, and I, I think that the, the last thing I want to say about the, uh, the, the state of the, of the nation is we, we want to come together. Everybody wants to come together. One, one of the things that, that we know, the, the head of the Liberty Science Center was, was talking to us this morning, and he, and he said they actually are going to have more people this year in the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, more visitors than they've ever had before. People want to come out and get back together, and they, and they particularly want cultural experience with each other. And we, and that's a great American tradition, and it's, it's important to libraries. Uh, you know, if, if you take 2019, and I think we're about to, to succeed in getting back to 2019, two, over two billion people uh, visited libraries and museums in, uh, in 2019. That is the greatest use of public space in America by far. Um, and, uh, and it's extraordinary. And the library as a place is so important. And, and its importance is even greater today because it is the one unifying thing that we do is to come together at the library to experience delight and enlightenment, uh, to learn something and just to be together. And we need a lot more of that. One of the solutions to things like book banning and the various polarization and you know, trying to put librarians in jail in certain places um, is community conversation. We need to have more community conversation. Librarians have always been good at that. I think we've gotten away from it a little bit. Um, yeah, I think the pandemic, of course, made, made it much harder to do, uh, but I think it's reinvigorating. Uh, it's naturally reinvigorating itself because of the end of the, of the pandemic. But, and it's the most important thing we can do. Uh, the various forms of literacy, the various forms of information delivered at the local level, at the, at the level where we still have civic trust. You can see we've had a 75 year decline in civic trust at the national level, the national institutional level. Uh, government and vir virtually every other institution uh, has declined in terms of the level of trust uh, and really dramatically declined. Uh, the presidency, the, the uh, Congress, et cetera. Um, but at the local level, we still have trust in, in civic institutions, and particularly in libraries, and, and, and we have to make use of that. Uh, and, and, and by making use of that, I say we have to start the conversation, we have to talk about information, we have to deliver information in a way that people can understand it at the local level. I was in Senator Moran's office, conservative Republican from the great state of Kansas, and uh, we were talking about information literacy. We were talking about the pandemic. And he said, you know who you go to for information, for information about the pandemic, for information about anything that has to do with your health. You want to go to the, the, the man or the woman, the doctor who either delivered you or delivered your child. And, and, and I think that's so true. The person you trust with your life, literally, at the local level. And, and uh, you may not trust your librarian with your life, but you will trust your librarian with information. You will trust your librarian to, to find what it is you really need. So that's my, my view of the, the, the state of the library uh, today. And I, you know, I think we, we owe a lot to, 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 to Deb Fallows and her husband uh, for pointing out how important libraries are in this civic revival at the, at the local level and being the heart of the community. We do indeed, Crosby. There's just beautiful sentiments and and right on. Uh, the uh, you, you touched on the the issue of trust, and I'm sure if there was a measure of that, uh, it would also be in general decline. As you know, what and who, uh, as the as technology has swept over society, we're increasingly dependent upon it and increasingly lacking in trust of it. So. Uh, librarians continue to be there for people. I mean, undocumented people will walk into a library and ask for help because they they don't they don't fear they're going to get you know busted just for asking a question. Um, I, it's you walked into something really uh, uh, amazing, uh, Crosby. I mean, you 
you were appointed to the job, I think in January or something like that. And then like 2020, six weeks later, we, 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 we got the, the pandemic. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't in the job description. Um, well, on the other hand, you know, libraries did such a, a great job. So many libraries, you know, again, I use the Highwood Library as an example, but also the Memphis Library, the Sacramento Library, I'm sure it's got stories. Um, you know, and you do, Don. Uh, libraries played a great lifelong role. But one one of the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, chief uh, the, the uh, our chief operating librarian uh, uh, Joel Jones in the Kansas City Public Library. This is after I left, but he created fairly quickly a program of calling older patrons of the library after the pandemic started, just to find out how they were, and, uh, and I, a lot of libraries did that. Um, and, and, you know, when the libraries closed, you know, how do you stay in touch with the patrons? Well, we found a lot of different ways to do that and were a lifeline, a connector, uh, as libraries always have, uh, have been. And, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was very, I was proud to know Joel. I don't think I would take any credit for anything he did. He knew, knew libraries before, before I did. But um, a lot of great stories of outreach, yeah. Uh, but I, I just wanted to focus on the fact that you you were appointed to lead a, a federal agency. Uh, you have you know you visited D.C. You've spent a little time there, but you've never worked there. And then for the first two years, you still didn't work there. You, you yeah, had I to work for home. Like yeah, everybody I else, really, and lead this agency from my basement in Kansas City, my basement library, and, in Kansas City. And then then the federal government decided they were going to pump. Uh, double the budget through your through right. your apparatus that you were right. already kind of barely keeping up with no offense yeah, and they didn't yeah and they didn't give us any extra uh people so um you know i'm, I'm uh, dealing with therapy for for a, a lot of my staff uh but um yeah but you know i mean they came through they were they yeah. mission very mission driven and you know a lot of our money goes through state librarians our largest program and you know they're again a very trusted group of people they're mission driven group of people um, we're a true federal program in that the money really gets spent at the state level and the local level um and, you know we set some rules but once we set the rules they go go and do it and uh, it, uh, it's it's always been I've always been really proud of of what we did during the pandemic, what the state libraries did during the pandemic, and what local libraries did during the pandemic. You know, above and beyond, as many people really? did, of course. But um, we can. Well, be we're proud. all we're all grateful to you and all the libraries that that did respond and, and stepped up to just a really difficult time. So hopefully things are. The other thing that I'm really proud of is in the first week of the lockdown, we did webinars with the CDC and with Johns Hopkins, and they couldn't answer any questions about things like books or interactive exhibits, computers, et cetera. What, you know, what, what, what do you do about the virus? The, you know, uh, how long will it last? Those kinds of things. And we went out and actually did our own research with Patel uh, in Columbus, uh, Ohio, and uh, with the CDC as a partner, with the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress as a partner and funding from the Mellon Foundation and, the, and Carnegie uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we're entrepreneurial. Um, not many federal agencies are capable of saying that they're entrepreneurial, but I think we can say we were entrepreneurial during the pandemic. I'm going to add that blade to the Swiss Army life knife here, metaphor. Uh, okay, Deb, um, you, you've written so much about, about libraries and beautifully, we've listed some of your articles, not all of your articles, but some of them uh, that are on the, uh, on the uh, registration site, uh, and uh, as well as some articles that I wanted to mention about, Cros about Crosby, not by Crosby, but about Crosby. And you should check out his, uh, his background, how he came to be a librarian. <laughs> it's quite a story itself. But uh, Deb, you have, you're going to tell us how you came to be absorbed with libraries and how you took on this project of, of uh, visiting them and, and writing about them. Welcome. Sure. 
Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks for inviting me here and for I'm I'm very honored to be on this panel with Crosby. And thanks, Kathy, for um, the fund for funds for learning to support this this show today. Um, also, I wanted to well, I'll just give you a little bit of back about my background and how I came to libraries. Uh, my husband, Jim, and I spent about four years in our little plane crisscrossing the country. Um, this was post-recession, starting in about 2012 or 13 or so. Uh, we had just come back from China and learned that during our travels and reporting in China, where we learned most was in the small villages that were outside the major cities where, where we were, quote, living at the time, Beijing and Shanghai. So we'd get out into the countryside as much as we possibly could. When we came back to the U.S. and wanted to see what was going on in this country as it was coming out of the recession and was, were people in communities were addressing what had happened to them if the mine closed or the mill closed or the factory closed, was there recovery going on and what was happening in these towns? So we um, we started, we have a, a, a very little plane, a propeller plane that we started traveling around the country in and thought we'd stop in a couple cities just to see. And those couple cities turned into about 50 cities over, over a four or five year period. Um, and my secret weapon in this, I must say, was the first time I stumbled into a library, and I say stumbled, in Burlington, Vermont. We usually, when we landed in cities, we would go see what we call the usual suspects, people in, in someone in education, someone in the government, um, who the movers and shakers were in town. And I thought, you know, I'll just go into the library and see, see what I have to learn from them. And I thought, I had no idea. The first time I went into the Burlington Public Library and they were so welcoming was a real introduction to, um, I think what uh, Crosby mentioned was, I learned that the libraries are the heart and soul of the communities. If you wanna know what's going on in the community, you go to the library, you talk to the librarians, you talk to the staff and you say, so, What's going on in your community? And you can see by the answers that they give and by the services that they offer and by the activities that they offer, that they are responding to the needs and the wants of the communities. I learned so much from going from one library to the next and made libraries my first stop from then on wherever we went. Um, I wanted to, there's so much that has resonated in all of these libraries, which I'm going to give you a kind of view from the street as a reporter of what I've seen in these dozens and dozens of libraries across the country from when I started to, to, to now, and I've been keeping up with the librarians. Um, I want to also thank Don for pointing me to the uh, talk by the Irish um, writer, editor, critic, Fintan O'Toole, that he gave at the Princeton Lub Public Library. He was going on and on about li what libraries meant to him in his youth, which of course gets everyone thinking about, well, what did libraries mean to me in my youth? And I know everyone on this, this um, Zoom today probably has a story about that. Um, for me, I think that it was the, the first time that I felt and independence, both physically and intellectually, to roam about the country. When I was 10 years old, uh, my family moved to a small town in northern Ohio. It's called Vermilion, Ohio. And um, it was it's right on the lake. There, there, you know, it was a great place to grow up. But the the first thing that I learned there was with my best friend we had the independence to go by ourselves to walk to the public library. It was a mile away. So we trooped, you know, through the town and felt really grown up and felt really proud and independent to be able to walk into that library. And there we would sit for hours at a time on those hot afternoons in the summer, just kind of prowling around the kids section um, for reasons maybe some of you can answer. Every book in the kids section that I found was was um, rebound in these bright orange, very heavy cardboard covers. So you really had to prowl. You really had to look to, you know, inside the, co the cover 
you don't know a book by its cover. You didn't know any of these books because they all look the same. So it was it was really a chance for me to kind of grow up and become independent, both physically to get to that library and stay there by ourselves, and then to roam about intellectually to see what was there. Um, that there is such a change from the library that I knew as a kid, lo these many decades ago, to what I've seen in public libraries as I've been around the country. Um, and God knows what kids today are going to say about their libraries once they grow up and reflect on everything that they have had the chance to do in libraries. Um, back then, it was really just about coloring contests. That was the only kind of extracurriculars besides reading books that the libraries offered. But now I, I just want to kind of take you on the walk with what I saw on the ground in libraries in three different areas. One is the people that I saw in libraries. Two are, is, are the activities so broad ranging as, as you both have all mentioned so far that I saw in libraries. And three is the creativity of libraries to respond. And I'm gonna call them in a way second responders because so much of it is the emergency response to whatever is happening in, in that community. And the library just taking up the challenge to speak to the problems, which they consider as opportunities to answer. Uh, so starting out with the people, um, one of the really most moving things to me about being in libraries is speaks to the library as a public democratic institution. It is the only, it is one of the rare places in, in a community where you find everyone on equal footing. And ev that means everyone. Patrick Lazinski, who's the CEO of the Columbus, Ohio Public Library, is a tremendous system, often talks about the words that are engraved in the granite above the door of, that, of the main library, open to all. And you really mean all. The first thing you see at if you go to a library early in the morning before it opens are people who are are people who are without homes, homeless people, unhoused people, whatever, however we want to refer to that group of people today, waiting for the library to open because it is a safe place, a cool or warm place, and above all, a place where they can find respect in their everyday lives. I generally see homeless people in Washington, D.C. on the street. And I don't feel they are on equal footing with me or vice versa until I go into the library. And we're all in that space, sharing that space. And I had a couple of homeless people tell me in various libraries that this is they, they go there because this is the one place where they feel they are respected. And that says a lot to the democratic institution of libraries. Refugees and immigrants in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is... 10% refugees. It is um, the Erie Public Library is really a lifeline for those who arrive. And it's the first stop for the um, settlement services to take the refugees into the library to say, here is a place for you. And here is how we can help you in this community, whether it's ESL classes or pointing out the shelves that have books in their language or helping them use the public computers to com communicate with people in the lands that they have left. Um, whether it's citizenship classes to, to help them adjust to the town or just, just be an extra resource for the settlement services on where they might live, what the schools are like, where they can, can introduce, uh, where they can enroll their children. Um, for the refugees and immigrants, the libraries are, are an open door and a, and a tremendous resource. For the fancier foreigners, it's the same thing. I was surprised when we were in Greenville, South Carolina, which has a big population of Germans and French from BMW and Michelin, which are, have their American headquarters in Greenville, South Carolina. I would The staff in the library would tell me regularly how the the French and German women would come into the library and kind of look around and, and be amazed at all the offerings that were there and say, 
is this for free? Can we come in here? Can we be part of this? Because that just wasn't the way that libraries around the world necessarily operated. It, the other people are, you all mentioned the entrepreneurs, and this is any, anyone from the um, DIY uh, dreamers who go into the maker spaces in libraries and use, learn how to use all the equipment to Laguna, California, which Laguna Beach, it's a pretty tony place and they have beautiful library out there. When I was in there talking to the library and she was pointing out, yeah, at this table, it's always the same group of, of startup guys, young kids who are at this table. It's like they have assigned seats. They come there to work in the morning. They take their meetings outside, outdoors on their phones. And I said, look, you know, I've asked a number of librarians about this. Do you kind of resent that they're taking up so much space and, and using your library as offices? And they would say, absolutely not. We hope that they will remember that this is where they got their start in the public library and come back to kind of pay it back to us. Um, on the other end of the scale are, are, it, are the programs for literacy that has been mentioned already. Redlands, California, the biggest volunteer program among the residents in Redlands is the um, reading program of for literacy to teach adult to adult how to read. Redlands is also a fairly affluent community, um, or I would say maybe middle class, but all kinds. All kinds means that, can you believe the numbers of illiterate people who walk into that library, a place of trust and a place of where they can go without a sense of embarrassment and say, I don't know how to read. I need to learn how to read. Can you help me how to read? Can you help me learn how to read? So having that, that sense of trust that the libraries have that people from the, the very, from the high and low ends of our socioeconomic status will find themselves there. Um, the activities in the library, it's much more than the coloring contest that I, I saw and took part in when I was a kid. There, there's the usual um, assortment, the, the films, the book talks, the author talks, the town meetings that go there. Um, but it's you know blown up into so much more than that. The Winston-Salem Library is truly an art gallery and they have rotating exhibits and permanent art in there. You can go into that place as for a film festival or as for an art gallery, the library in Winston-Salem. Most libraries now, the bigger ones, have local history rooms, genealogy rooms, maker spaces, lending libraries. In Burlington, Vermont, they rotate the lending libraries from shovels and snow equipment in the winter to um, rakes and garden equipment in the summer. In my own library in Vermilion, Ohio on the lake, you can borrow fishing poles to go fishing. In the Denver Public Libraries, you can get a whole kit that you borrow to go hiking in the mountains, complete with you know everything you need as an amateur hiker. There are technology classes, Etsy classes in Bend, Oregon. Um, they, I think it was Bend. There, there were classes teaching people how to get set up to be um, to have your on, uh, in home business as an Etsy person. There are dancing classes in DC. You got you can learn how to do the tango in the main hall of the public main public library, which has been redone and is fabulous. Yoga, Tai Chi, um, music programs. It's and speaking. Of, also to the sense of trust in what's offered. I often asked um, the staff in the libraries, you know, what are people coming in here to ask you about? And the answers ranged all over the board. A lot of medical questions. And if people go to the libraries because they have a medical problem and they, they don't have a doctor to go to in their community, they'll go to the librarian and they can get you know, librarians can say, well, I can help you look this up, but I'm not official on this. And they will do it in complete, you know, anonymity and um, and with the authority they can run up. But also those libraries often respond in Arizona, for example, 
there is a, a rotating nurse on call who will go to the libraries in, in Pima County and um, another county whose name I can't remember because I'm a sufferer of this long COVID right now. And, and if I put it on my whiteboard, it's there, but it comes and goes in my brain quickly. Um, Pico County, Pima County, there's a nurse on call who regularly stops by the library and people can book the 10 minute sessions with them. There are there's advice on taxes, you name it, just everything. So those kinds of activities that are responses to what libraries see in the communities. As far as creativity, um, we can call libraries responders, we can call them second responders. They have been the responders routinely to natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, fires, um, to try to present a sense of normalcy back to the community when they've met with some kind of disaster. Keeping the, in New Jersey, keeping the story hours in the parking lot of the library after the hurricane flooded out the library. So the little kids could come and think, okay, there's something normal. I remember this going on in my life now. Or um, the floods in Houston, we happened to be in Texas during that time, and the, the libraries were the first ones to open, say, come here, you know, we've got electricity or we have a safe place for you to be. After the fires in Santa Barbara in California, it was a place for people to go to share their stories of the flooding and devastation, the fires, and then the flooding that happened in that very um, upscale resourceful town, but people needed this kind of emotional outlet where they felt they could go with the community and safely tell what had happened to them. Besides the natural disasters, the human, human caused disasters, the shootings and the riots. Libraries are the first to reopen in Ferguson, Missouri when the kids couldn't go back to school. The library said, come on in. And they, they offered classes and activities for the kids and they very smartly issued each of those kids a library card. So that's, the, that's an introduction. Um, same thing in Orlando after those um, club nightclub shootings, the library there became a, a kind of center where people could tell their stories, write their stories, display their art, read their poetry about the experiences they had as an outlet and a, a step towards healing. And then there's the pandemic where everything happened. The library's kind of closed, but like Crosby said, did everything they could to stay open. They called the older people who needed a voice to hear. They ran wires out of the library windows so people could come and to the outdoor tables and plug in their computers and get Wi-Fi when they might not have had it at home. They continued to feed the children and be a place where if school was closed, they could come and get their, their food rations that they would normally get in school. It was a place where in um, Burlington, Vermont and Erie, Pennsylvania, the town came to the libraries and said, we need your expertise. You're the guys who can help answer people's questions. So they were on the phones when people would call into the city government and, and ask questions about, about the pandemic. The librarians would be on the phone as expert researchers and say, you know, hang on, let me help you answer that question. Or collaborate with the help de health department in Erie, Pennsylvania, which really has built up these kinds of partnerships and associations that have been so important in this country from Tocqueville to the present day. Um, libraries are the best of collaborators. Um, there, were some, there were some weird things that happened so early in the pandemic when libraries didn't know what to do with their books, they actually thought, okay, and nobody had answers. We want to get those books into the hands of people. We'll do it through the drive through windows. Every time a book came in and went out, they baked them, baked them literally in a tiny oven, figuring at the state of the art at that point that baking the germs out of books would keep them safe. You know, we've since learned that the, that the coronavirus is not you don't get them from books, um, but being, feeling the both ob obligation, opportunity, independence to try things. If it didn't work, move on to the next thing. Um, and I'll stop talking now, but I think one thing probably people might want to talk about is 
while libraries have been the ones to respond to people whose lives have been upended, now librarians and libraries and staff at libraries are the one of the places that is being upended by the by the divisiveness, the hostilities, the the um, whatever we call it challenges to book bannings around the country. So the irony of that and and the pivoting that libraries are doing to address that, I think, is also um, part of who they are. So that's yeah. how proud I am of libraries and. We can go on for hours, but let's move along. Yeah, thank you. Well, you are moving along, and and please don't stop. This is this is amazing and wonderful. Your your take and and stories are inspiring. This is this is a moment really to recognize what these institutions are and do, and how utterly essential they are to communities. It's it's like your health, you know. You just don't appreciate it until you start to lose it. I think libraries are, are kind of the civic health. Um, I, I I caught your article on re second responders, and that really resonated with us. We we've been focusing on that very application, mostly on communications for inclusion, but communications also as a backup for for these disasters or any kind of an outage that, that people would have a place to go and. That the point that the libraries they have all this flexibility because they're they're community institutions that they're funded by the community. Their charter is anything the community wants to, to do, not schools, not clinics. They all have really specific things they can do and not do. But there's almost nothing that libraries can't do if their community wants it to. If they want to get rid of all the books. I don't recommend it, but you can do it. It's your library. And I think that's just so remarkable and so amazing. Uh, it creates the, it's yeah. a problem too, John. It creates the problem that the community wants the library to be involved in solving all its problems and <laughs> doesn't fund at the level that would get, you know, we're, we're not adding a lot of funding to, uh, to libraries. Uh, Tracy Hall, head of the ALA, is in our meeting and she mentioned a statistic about 26% of libraries saw their funding go down over the last few years. I don't remember the exact statistic, but so funding is if, if we do too many things, and this is what this is just a basic life lesson. If you do too many things, you don't do any of them well. And and so one of the things that that I think is really important, and uh, uh, Deb talked a, a, a lot about the, the story times, the the coloring, which uh, uh, and and all the many things that we're doing for for children uh, in the library. That seems to me needs as much focus as we can get it. We know the equity problem in this country starts uh, with education, starts uh, at uh, at the at the earliest uh, age. Uh, and 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 one of the, the the ways to address that problem is through literacy, and libraries have a key role uh, in that. And we need we need we need to make sure we're focusing on that. We need to make sure we're focusing on the children. You talked Deb about the 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 orange book covers. One thing's like librarians know is it. it and that we, we've gone more retail, if you will, in terms of the display of books and the presentation of books and what we do with story times. And, 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 and so the vibrancy of children's literature, which is frequently very available in, in the, the, the design uh, and the artwork in, in, in children's literature is a, is a big part of what we're uh, what we're uh, about these days and we, we have to i think i think we need to renew that focus on 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 children's literature children's librarians and and just pure basic literacy uh, it's a it's a great anchor for for everything else and your your point is well taken about you know too many things uh, uh, jack of all trades uh, master of, of none but that's of course not true it's master of many and maybe not master of some, but uh, uh, the the point that uh, that Deb made about seeking information, you know, the the responder, you suddenly you have a diagnosis and you're going, what is that about? And so you have to, you're as, you know, this deep researcher to have a place to turn to is is extraordinary. One of the complaints I have about government and libraries is that uh, as more agencies of government at every level automate 
they they fail to ask and answer the question, well, who are those e-government applications for? Well, oh, they're for people that are connected. Well, what about the tens of millions of people that aren't connected? Oh, uh, well, they go to the library. Well, great. Well, do you share any of your cost savings with the library to take on that extra burden? Well, no. Well, why not? Well, we don't have to. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. But it's uh, they just never say no. That's just the thing about. It. And I, I guess you're right. So it's, it's a very strength hard, of weak. To say, hard to say yes. And that and that is one of the great yeah. things about the ethic of, uh, of of librarians, but also the problem that you know we we can't lose focus on the most important things. And you know, we have to be you, the most important thing is to be respond. I mean, I think you're saying this, Don, and Deb's saying this is 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 to be responsive to the community. Um, uh, but there are there's still a hierarchy of need. Uh, and, uh, and and librarians are good at figuring that out too, uh, as well. Um, Don, there's an interesting comment in the chat mm -hmm. that, that's for everyone from um, from Arizona, from the Arizona State Library. I wonder, and it, it speaks to um, answering, it speaks to the health concerns of people who don't have access to healthcare often and what they have been doing in Arizona. I wonder if, if she might, I think it's a she. Maya, Maya. Maya. Might yes. want to, uh, talk Health, about that. Telehealth has become a thing. Uh, uh, Maya, are you there? You can weigh in here. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a number of sessions about this. Uh, libraries creating special spaces for uh, doctor interviews. And and uh, Maya, this are is you? Mala. 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 Uh, Sorry, look yeah. at Maya, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell us. Yes, we, we've been doing. Um, you know, telehealth way before uh, in libraries, way before it was called telehealth. Uh, we had uh, we used to have nurses come to the library, as Deb mentioned. And, uh, you know, the not only were libraries a safe place, but these nurses uh, walked in like a normal uh, library staff and they would actually help patrons um, with simple things like hygiene, give them little, you know, you have those uh, soaps and uh, shampoos and little bottles that can be distributed to them. Uh, they would take that, they were, you know, little things like behavioral issues. I had a fight with my mom today, uh, you know, and I don't know how to deal with it. And this, these people offered that a shoulder for them to, to, cry on, <laughs> you know, there was, there was this one case in Pima County where uh, a homeless uh, person had, uh, was going through garbage and had his finger cut, um, you know, with a bottle. And the nurse actually offered to clean it up for him, put some Band-Aid and stuff that they would never have, uh, you know, access to because they were homeless, right? Uh, but the library went on from doing that. Of course, the library is always provide information uh, through their web resources for the most sophisticated patron who um, needed to know more about the diagnosis. But, you know, helping people what in whatever issues they wanted, whether it was substance abuse or behavioral issues or immunization, should I, shouldn't I kind of thing, was all being done even before the pandemic. But after the pandemic, it became even more critical that we do something uh, more because telehealth then became a thing. You know, when people didn't have access, internet access at home to connect with their doctor, uh, they didn't have the things that they needed to take their vitals. For example, the doctor would ask, hey, okay, what's your weight today? I don't know. What's your temperature today? I don't know. So we thought that uh, it would be a good idea to provide these health kits. And these health kits are portable. Uh, they come, uh, they, in a, we can put them in a backpack and we can have several of them available in the library. We do actually at the Pima County, we did, we're doing two pilots, one at Arvaka and the other at Aho. Both these libraries are very close to the border and we have people just crossing over and coming to the library. It's a safe place for them to be, and they connect to their doctor from there. And they have all those um, kits available, not just one, but multiple. 
so that oh, that's be, great. yeah they can be used in the that's library great story. yeah so, the state libraries as Crosby mentioned earlier are just essential to uh, libraries in America that they right. act as a vehicle for for funding for ideas for communication they especially look out for the smaller libraries which is uh, uh, there's a big difference between New York Public Library and the small town library but in essence they have a, a lot of the same uh, Crosby is that your hand you're raising yeah I raised my hand um, so Ed, Ed Jasmine uh, asks a, a, a question in the chat too that re relates to this. Is that li libraries are doing a lot inside the library, and, and you know, in Kansas City, we started doing before the pandemic, as you know, as Deb said and uh, as Mala said, uh, a lot of things with clinical uh, application. Uh, eyeglasses, for instance, we, we, we had a doctor, a wealthy doctor, who w w did clinics on on, on uh, eyeglasses, and would we distributed for free uh, uh, eyeglasses to, to kids who needed them. You know, a big a big part of the literacy problem, actually. Um, and uh, and to, to Jasmine's question about how you do that kind of thing outside the library. It, number one, it's something that libraries do pretty well, better better than almost any other institution in America. We partner, we partner with 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 other institutions. So partnering with your local health institutions, we partnered a lot with the Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, which was the inner city library. Um, in, well, sorry, inner city uh, the hospital. Um, partnering and 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 doing, you know, we. we we had a relationship with the the largest daycare center uh, in uh, in the state of Missouri, run by two nuns uh, in in an inner city location, four hundred kids, and so we took story time to them, um, and 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 we partnered with with the daycare center uh, in various ways r relative to healthcare, relative to uh, literacy. Um, and and, and edu education in in general, and and so you go where where people are. You set up computer centers, uh, uh, offsite computer centers. We we did that uh, in community centers uh, in Kansas City, uh, and you know which can relate to literacy. Uh, it can relate to workforce development, skill set uh, you know, uh, creation. You know the. Uh, everything happens online, but m many people don't know the kinds of things that happen online. Uh, education for uh, for for jobs, uh, telehealth that we're talking about, et cetera. Most people, not most people, but many people don't know that that can happen online, and you have to get out to them uh, through the community centers. We have relationships with uh, many many churches and uh, and church halls uh, that have. Uh, 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 open to everyone in the community, not just to their uh, to their congregation. Uh, uh, open services to to them, and, and libraries are partnering in those locations to deliver all the services we're talking about. Uh, excellent, Deborah. Uh, just a question for we're kind of a couple of minutes here left for both of you. We've touched on a lot of amazing things and experiences that people have at libraries, the services they do. And yet at the same time, they're under siege. I mean, we've never had a time, it seems like, where libraries had antagonists. Every other institution has armies of people marching against them, but libraries were just, you know, maybe I don't care, but I have nothing against them. But now, in you know, it, it's it's moving from banning books. Well, let's just simplify things. We'll just close the library. That'll take care of that problem. My question is, what what would you recommend as a as a campaign or an antidote to help people really understand the value of libraries. Something needs to happen. You know, something significant needs to happen to reverse the, the trend that's going on. Deb, what do you think? Um, I have two different answers for this. Um, one is, is, I think it has to, the answer has to come from the local libraries themselves because they're the ones who know the communities best. And, um, I was talking to a librarian in, in Burlington, Vermont, about was anything happening with the book bans? Were they hearing, were they being challenged and so forth? And she said, you know, this is a pretty progressive town, which we all know. Nothing basically is happening here. We're ready if something does happen, but that is that is not an issue for us. And it is not what we're hearing from our community. That's very different from what I heard in a couple other communities where 
it is on their doorstep in, out in Oregon, for example, um, where they, the libraries are, um, they are prepared for this and they're educating and training the staff on how to defuse um, personal confrontations, how to go through the process of challenges. And there's a very formal process. And of some, if someone says, get this book out of here, they say, okay, here's the process we have. Start here with this. And then they go through it. And um, going to the, to the states themselves. I, I'm sure a lot of people on this have heard what I did coming out of Illinois, that there is a new, new legislation, which is a ban on banning books. Um, and public libraries that choose to ban books that are offensive for certain reasons, like political reasons, are going to lose their public funding as of January of 2024. So the what I'm hearing is two different sides of this story. And it's, it's critical that the libraries themselves know their communities and know what they know their communities, that they figure out what to do not that it's national. And I, I would just end on one thing. Over the 10 years that I've been visiting and learning and seeing and talking to libraries, I have seen a real shift that maybe would put you at ease a little bit, Don. I used to hear so much at the beginning of people inside libraries saying, libraries are the best kept secret, and we don't want to be the best kept secret in town. I don't hear that anymore. I hear much more the stories of people know are starting to know and are knowing what's going on in their local library and are supporting them and showing up and going there. So I think the trend is under, underway and um, more of the same will push it along in that direction. Love and, that. Love to hear that. Crosby, what, so I, what is outlook? Crosby, tell us what's the state of the library. What, what's our, what does it look like for us, the future? Well, I mean, there's a problem here, that, and, and, and I think Deb's addressed it exactly uh, correctly, is it, it, at the community level, it has to be at the community level. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of states banning book banning because that, that, that essentially inflames uh, folks at the local level who think there is a problem. And there's a, and 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 there there are two there are two issues here. I think one is is a general issue of the over sexualization of our culture, and that's reflected in books and and it's much more reflected in cable television and you know online websites and whatnot that kids all have access to, and and it needs to be pointed out to the moms for or against liberty, whichever which I think on different days there. Or one or the other, but um, uh, that, you know, the, the libraries really aren't the problem here. The, pro the problem, and it does exist, is is online and on TV and, and cable, et cetera. And the, and the second thing is 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 a little bit more nuanced. So if you take two of the most uh, banned books, and and we have to be careful about saying banned. Real, most of the time, there are some actual bans or take it out of the library moments. But a lot of this is taking it off the reading list, not actually taking it out of the library, but taking it off the reading list, which is really not a book ban. Um, take Huckleberry Finn and take The Bluest Eye. These are both important books. Um, Huckleberry Finn is has been banned in various places for various reasons for a long time. Um, and, 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 and one of the primary reasons today that Huckleberry Finn makes a list is that there are 219 mentions of the N word in, uh, in Huckleberry Finn. Now, the community conversation ought to be with the parent of the child uh, who may not want their 10 year old, right? I read Huckleberry Finn at the age of nine or 10 for the first time, uh, exposed to the, that that word that many times in that book. Now, Huckleberry Finn is one of the great anti-racist books in the history of, it, it is the first great anti-racist book, except maybe for Uncle Tom, uh, uh, for Harry Beecher Stowe. Um, but uh, but it, it's a difficult book, I would think, if you're uh, an African-American child at a certain age. And, 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 and so there needs to be a conversation about that. Can't just say, ban book banning or don't have this conversation, this conversation. Um, and then The Bluest Eye. The Bluest Eye is a Toni Morrison book. All of Toni Morrison's book are important. She's a Nobel Prize winner. She's one of the great American writers. Any library of any size should have the collected works of Toni Morrison. 
But the bluest eye, reading the bluest eye at the age of, again, 10, 11, 12, 13, some, somewhere in there is very difficult. The, the, the compelling and repeated scene, the central scene is a very degrading racist moment, um, uh, sexualized raci racist moment. And does every, should this be promoted to, it should be available in the library, it seems to me, any, any good library, but should be promoted to uh, a child. Do we think age appropriateness is still a, an important concept? And I would say most librarians would probably agree that there are some things that are age appropriate uh, at, at a younger age and some things that are not. And we're not really having that conversation. We think we're having a First Amendment conversation. And we should have that conversation when it's necessary, but sometimes it needs to be a conversation about what's right for somebody's child uh, at a certain age. And uh, in parts of the library world, I won't mention any, anything, anybody or any, any organization specifically, we've abandoned that standard. Um, and, that, and, and we need to get back to what is a library world uh, uh, historic uh, character. Uh, which is to have conversations in the community, uh, to work with parents, not not to not to put parents on one side and the library on another side. Isn't that exactly what uh, librarians are professionally trained to do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> consult with people about reading always, material. We've always been good at, and I mean, you know, there there are going to be disagreements that we can't get over from time to time, um, and. And, 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 and that, that's going to be true. Uh, and, 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 and there is a politicization of this. The moms, moms for Liberty, I sometimes call them the Moms Against Liberty, have a playbook. And some of this is directed from political source at the national level. I call it the K Street phenomenon. You know, the uh, folks who, who see they're making political headway, they think they're winning the culture war. And part of what we need to say at, at, as, as community leaders is we need to say everybody loses in the culture war. There are no victors in the, in the, in the culture war. Uh, and if we turn it into a war, uh, then, uh, then we're all gonna, gonna be losers. And, uh, and, and I say that to the right and I say that to the left. Let's 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 have a truce on the culture war and have a conversation. That's that's well said, uh, Crosby. Give us final word here on your outlook. What's is the outlook bright? Is it muddy? Is, is it dismal? What's the outlook for libraries in America? I, I think I think it's I think in the long run it's it's really good because I think we are recognized. Deb Deb just said this, and and all I'm doing is repeating what she said, but the uh, libraries were pretty well kept secret where, you know, we were the quiet librarians, we were the shushing librarians, and, and, now, and now we're the part of the community. And most people, most places in this country know that uh, over and over again. Swiss Army Knife, your phrase is, is a great phrase, uh, but, but I think most importantly, we are, we are the heart and soul. We're where people come together and talk to each other. We're where people come together and do things that they enjoy. We're the place where people come together and do things that enlighten them and delight them. And, uh, and, and, and you can build on that forever. Uh, we, we, are, we are the place that people come together. And it's true. Even, and in a crisis, people come together. Deb, last word. Uh, I, I think it. I think it all came from Crosby. I, I'm an um, optimist. I think the good guys will win here, and the voices will be stronger. Yes, yes. This has been just outstanding session. I want to thank you both so much for this. We're going to have the recording up in a in a day or so. Uh, we normally have more people watching the the videos than actually show up for the session. This is the you know the reality of schedules. But this has been wonderful to hear from both of you. And I, many, many more people need to hear your voices. And we hope that we'll have contributed somewhat to that. So please, both of you, come back at another time. Uh, and we'll see what's been happening since we checked in today. But this is great. And so with that, we'll sign off. Uh, we'll hang around and talk a little bit if anybody has time, wants to. But we're going to end the recording now. Thank you. Thank you. Recording. Stop.